Top Bed Talk. Monty Mython here. As we prepare to move into the next phase of the COVID crisis, we're going to be widening our focus here on Top Bed Talk. We will continue to deliver COVID-specific programmes, but we all have a huge additional responsibility as we try to reboot normal services. So although this piece is not directly related to COVID-19, we believe it's information that is crucial to the bigger task of rebuilding the healthcare system as we learn to adapt and live with this new virus. Thank you to our sponsors and to you, our listeners, for helping us to share this important information. Okay, hi, I'm Monty Mythen, Editor-in-Chief of Top Mid Talk. Now, I've been uh, lucky enough to collar two friends and colleagues from UCL, uh, Professor David Walker and Dr. Robert Stevens. Uh, David, Professor of Interesting Stuff at UCL. How did they manage to make you a professor? <laughs> yeah, early in the morning. I wonder that myself. Uh, but indeed, that's my title. And... Um, we're busy trying to walk the walk um, on, on the shop floor this morning after a, a couple of days of great activity. Uh, uh, D- David, uh, education is your big, uh, your big thing. I mean, we, we're all supposed to, we're all into education at UCL. I should back up yeah. on that one. We're here, we're here for our students. <laughs> we are. Okay, honestly. <laughs> so we, I just met one this morning. You did. A medical student over here working on the coffee bar over here said, oh. You're Rob Stevens. <laughs> so she's Rob in a second as well. It's true. <laughs> you so, can't go anywhere these days. <laughs> so, so, so David, give us your official title at UCL then. Oh, uh, well, um, I guess I am a perioperative medicine professor of education. Right, professor of education. Rob, you've got a new title at UCL. I yeah. have, I'm head of clinical and professional practice for the medical school. Excellent. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you very much. So, yeah, so that's you. why that young lady, she knows, that's you're right. the only, she, <laughs> that's there's right. no way she'd recognise the professors, I should point out, I'm a professor <laughs> at UCL as well, allegedly. Yeah. But, but yeah. she noticed you. Yeah, she did. Well, she how did. was she able to face check you? Uh, so it's really great because at UCL we've now managed to start teaching year ones, year threes, year fours and year sixes. So we're starting to move into you know, teaching the young students some physiology, some transferable skills, a bit of communication, uh, some sort of harder science like blood gases. And uh, myself and Jane Lowry, who's one of my colleagues at the Royal Free, do a uh, sort of feedback lecture, two or three hour summary lecture, trying to pull things from the clinical time um, and, and sort of show them what the, the point is of their physiology they're learning. Excellent. Physiona, you're wearing a fantastic T-shirt. I am. Thank you much. I think I recognise that Carl Vassiman's is, diagram from the legendary book about cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Yep. And it's from Carl Vassiman's course, which I went to. Oh, well done you. So Thank it's you. three cogs representing yep. muscle circulation and ventilation. For yep. those of you who are into CPET, let's see if we can get a picture of it to put up at the say, front I'm of that. Yeah. Picture right now. Get a picture of it right now. It is a legendary photograph that summarises why cardiopulmonary exercise testing is interesting, useful and primary physiology. Smile. Yeah, smile, we'll get that up on front of the podcast. So, so David, you and your team, um, yeah, legend at UCL, for producing one of the most popular MSc courses at UCL ever yeah. on perioperative medicine. Tell us that little story quickly. Oh, well, I, I guess we just rose to the challenge or spotted a chink in the armour for online learning, Monty. Yeah. Uh, so we could reach, extend our reach beyond UCL and get to the world. Uh, I guess that's what we've done. Five continents. 129 countries, um, all through the power of the internet, really. So, um, and how many people have registered to do the MSc so far? I know that uh, whether they complete it or not is a complicated uh, equation, but uh, yeah, you can give us the primary metric, which is how many people signed up. Yeah, well, the answer to that is 300. Wow. Um, you'd think that if it was online, you could have thousands, but actually it doesn't work like that because someone has to mark the papers, somebody has to set the exams. Yeah. So actually 300 is still a big volume of patient, uh, a volume of students. And we've had a number of people through here who have been telling us that they're you know, doing the master's programme and how much they've been enjoying it and how highly they value it. it? Yeah, I think we've noticed a difference this year. People coming up to the stand and actually getting into the detail. Um, yeah. Before it was a cursorily give us a, a flyer and we'd go away with that. But now they're coming up, they want to do the detail. What is this frailty thing? You know, how many learning hours do I get from X, Y, and Z? So I think, I think we've arrived, really. Yeah. So um, in total, how many hours of learning do you have to do? Well, it's, don't forget, Monty, it's notional learning hours. Okay. So it's not sitting in front of a computer for 1,800 hours. And that's, <laughs> wow. Is that's, that, is that yeah. the total? <laughs> yeah, that's Epoch. the total. But, you know, these notions. Well, that's incredible value for money. <laughs> I think so, Monty. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
So, so in total, and you, you can do that in a year or spread it over a number of years? Yeah, we can. Uh, it's called flexible learning, flexible being one to five years. Uh, most of our students from our metrics tell us that we do it, they do it over about three years. Okay. Because most people are in full-time employment. And um, it, it, it's staged that you can get certificates and diplomas en route. So you can, you can knock, if you do over three years, you can knock something off every year. And you bet. You can have a party every year. You can have a party every year and a certificate every year. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a win-win on our course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, now, quite a lot of people do the, well, let's call it the teaser. There's this yeah. MOOC thing. What's a MOOC? Yeah. Um, well, the MOOC comes from our same stable. Uh, the MOOC, again, is an online course which joins up a community of learners uh, across the globe. And it is indeed that. It's a taster. It's a dip into what is perioperative medicine, what are the fundamentals of perioperative medicine, and asks a lot of questions that people may want to delve in and find the answer to. And what does MOOC stand for again? Massive Open Online Course. So the massive means that it's open-ended thousands in fact we have on our last course about 18,000 students so cool. excellent now i'm joined by the managing editor-in-chief of top med talk and the lead anchor in the usa by, by desiree do you Chappell. remember my name <laughs> you know it's because you usually do the introducing I usually so do. it's easy for me to just say hello you usually do all the hard work hello monty from, from, from louisville we can all practice saying that in kentucky in yeah. the usa Hi, monty. So i know you're gonna have got some questions for david about the, the mooc in particular and then the msc you, have you done the MOOC yet? Have you had a look at it? <laughs> so I think the, the problem with the, the, the MOOC is that um, the beauty of it, but the, the problem for me is that instead of trying to do it in the four weeks and just doing it for free, I went ahead and just paid for the certificate. So now I have all the time in the world to do it, and I just haven't sat down to finish it. So I started it, but I haven't finished it yet, the MOOC. Yeah, and I mean, the MOOC's 16 hours, is it? It's uh, so, it's, yeah, it's not 12, a ton. 12. 12. Three, 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 four, three. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So I'm now I, I need to get, to, I need to do it because I, I think it's I mean, amazing. I love it. I think it's a great, it is a great teaser and um, it's made me seriously think about the master's program. I mean, honestly, even though I, time-wise, I don't know if I could actually do We'll talk it. more. We'll I know, more. I know, I know. Yeah. But uh, it's fantastic. We talked to Sam uh, Bampo yeah. the other day about, about the master's program and telling us a little bit more. Uh, about it. I think that um, one point or a couple points about it, it's multidisciplinary. So any anyone can take it. You Absolutely. don't have to be a physician. Absolutely. And we've got nurses, pharmacists. We've even got a couple of industry uh, ah. colleagues involved. Um, physiotherapists. Yeah, across, across, across the piece, really. Yeah. I, I suspect mainly physicians, but actually a lot of nurse nursing representation too. Yeah. Yeah, that's what Sam was saying. It was, um, it was, it was, you know, represented. And um, and the other point is that that you can just literally do it any time that you want to. And from anywhere. And, and anyway, yeah, the international the international aspect. I mean, that was big for us, and I I hear you beating yourself up about, <laughs> up about not finishing the course. But actually, we shouldn't do that. You know, know online courses know. are, by their definition, pick up, put down. Um, and that's the beauty of it. You will get round to finishing when yeah. it suits you. Yeah, that is the beauty of it, for sure. And I think type A personalities, we have to just die, you know, kind of get used to the online thing because you're so used to doing everything. Deadlines. Gotta have it. Yes. Deadlines. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, we sort of tossed around, didn't we, Dave, with thinking about should we have a more conventional structure um, in terms of getting people through on deadlines but we ultimately sort of went away from that. Is that the, the benefits. free four, four weeks part, though? That is, you have to f- complete it in that time, don't you? So I think the, the MOOC you have to complete in six weeks. Yeah. Um, and we recommend all... Uh, Abby Whiteman, who, who really led it, leads it, uh, recommends you, you try and do three hours a week if you can. Yeah. Partly because you're going through and then interacting with other people on the course. Yeah. And that's really nice. It is. Um, yeah. And yeah. how many people have done the MOOC so far, roughly? Um, we're probably close to 20,000, certainly over 19,000. Wow. Yeah. That's really so that's in 129 countries and soon to be 140 countries. I know what I was going to ask. Do you translate any of the, the content? So the MOOC has been translated to Spanish. Uh-huh. Uh, we didn't actually translate the audio of the film, but there's, there's uh, transcripts. Yeah. Uh, so it's in Spanish as well. For yeah. Spanish speakers. Because we had a good, uh, we, uh, Evan Karash was here yesterday, the editor in chief of anesthesiology. Excuse me for a second. <coughs> Talking their translation into numerous different languages. Mm. I think understand, you might want to have a chat with him about how he's achieved that mm. with his various different networks. Maybe you know, be able to chip in. Um, uh, you might, <laughs> I'm not promising he'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he's done Spanish, Portuguese, Mandarin, 
uh, French. Fr- French in particular we were talking about. And the yeah. reason yeah. French was because of Francophonic mm. Africa. Because yeah. yeah. a big swathe yeah. Yeah. of Africa that doesn't okay. get picked up. So we want to push the French you yeah, know, up, the, up, the, up the chain a little bit. We've got some good, fr- good French speakers in the department. Yep. Per- we could do that. <laughs> and the Spanish um, translation instantly got us to South America. Yeah. And yes. that was fantastic. Absolutely. You know, overnight the numbers went through the roof. That's yeah. great. Portuguese. You're going to do some Mandarin or whatever. The Chinese. Yeah. yeah. It's labour intensive, but we yeah. should be looking at that. And Absolutely. I think probably mm. we will be. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, next steps there. Now, now, Rob, you've been heavily involved in the, I think, the MSC, the MOOC, et cetera, et cetera. But the medical students are, mm. are, are your mm. big baby. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think, in a way, as anesthesiologist, it's a sort of open door to go into the medical school because we're uniquely suited to teach medical students. I mean, we're, we're naturally good communicators. We sort of collaborate. Our sort of structure is quite horizontal. We don't tell people what to do. Uh, we, we're used to one-to-one teaching. And, of course, we are physiology, you know, drug, 30 seconds, dramatic physiological change. Yeah. So there's so much we can, we can bring there. And there's a lot of us. There's huge numbers of us where there's a lot of anaesthetists. And there's sort of a, a push at UCL, which you've been a part of driving, to sort of build surgical training around a spine of perioperative medicine. Yeah, that's so right. perioperative medicine is the core of what you need to learn as a, as a doctor. <clears throat> And then the fact that it dips into certain surgical procedures is now deemed to be a bit more of a secondary issue. It is. I, I would say, though, that probably the traditional silos are still present, Monty. Okay. I mean, that is the dream that, you're, that yeah. you've just sort of uh, highlighted. Um, and I think many medical schools have got that. People who've re- totally redesigned the curriculum uh, relatively recently have got your idea of sort of um, a perioperative block you do some surgery, do critical care, you do acute care. Some people have even got uh, airway surgeons teaching airway anatomy combined with, you know, anesthesia, sort of anatomy, if you like. So, um, so still really hard to get into medical school in the UK, yet we have a shortfall of doctors. What's that all about, Rob? Ooh. Probably not your, not your fault. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, guess, I don't think it is my fault. No, I think you're right. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's about workforce planning, isn't it, which I am not part of yet. Uh, you know, that's so where do you stand on the alternative providers? So Easy. Desiree is a nurse <laughs> anaesthetist. Oh, yeah. yeah, I know. <laughs> Which I think the history of that in the USA came out of uh, a manpower crisis back in the day in the 60s or so, was it? No, no actually, I think, well, I, people, it, the stories that I've heard is that we nurses were doing anesthesia Cause long was, before, actually, like during the civil, like a yeah. long, long time ago. And then you didn't have the, the doctor busy doing doc- other stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, and then, you know, and then it kind of became, mm. it's kind of fluctuated up and down, I think. Now, I think we've reached a, a, a tipping point in the UK where we are fully embracing non-clinician providers to yeah. do a lot of the burgeoning quantity of work mm-hmm. that's coming through, in my yeah. opinion, quite rightly. Mm. We have some colleagues in our department who are not physician trained, who are excellent anaesthetists. Correct. No, correct. Yeah. You're going to see that. Uh, is that going to grow, David? I know you've been trying to sort out us a training program. Yeah. Um, well, if the editor of BJA is listening, um, I sent him a, uh, a letter this week. Um, <laughs> You'll have it back soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, that on the back of um, Health Education England's report for workforce planning, which I think is a moderately limp document, but I thought it was a great opportunity for the college to embrace PAA yeah. training, or AA training as it's now called. A- and a- PAA and AA being... Uh, anesthetic associates whereas once they were physician associates in anesthesia and they come under this umbrella group MAPs medical uh, associate practitioners so they made that transition from physician assistant brackets anesthesia to anesthesia associates in other words the elements of independence are growing there yeah absolutely absolutely Um, there's there's nothing to fear there Um, you know we need a blended workforce um, and it will give us, as anesthesiologists, a greater independence and a greater freedom to bring our expertise to the shop floor, I think. Yeah. I, I, Monty and I talk about this frequently, um, in that you guys are kind of sticking with more the framework of, of a, PA, a PA type or anesthesia associate and not necessarily nurse nurses because you don't want to pull from your nursing workforce. I think, I, I honestly, I think that's happening a lot in the U.S. Yeah. Um, as they're pulling away from our critical care nurses. Um, they're being pulled in, in, into nurse anesthesia, and it's leaving a real crisis in, in critical care for... We don't have enough docs. Nurses. We don't have enough nurses. Mm-hmm. We don't have enough of almost everyone. So pulling from the existing pools does, is not going to work. Yeah, it's kind of tough. Yeah. Well, I, 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 of course, agree with that, Monty, but 
but I, I don't think we should shy away from no, the fact I don't that think you should limit that either. Who, who want to do other things express yeah. themselves, yeah. for goodness sake. Well, I mean, I've, I've been fortunate, and, and I'm so glad that I was able to go into anesthesia. I love it. I love it. I mean, I loved nursing, but this is, you know, this was my place, and I'm glad I had the opportunity. And I think for a lot of people, you know, as a nurse, there are sometimes you want to work your way into other things and work your way up, and that's a, a natural step for Critical care nurses, for Desiree, sure. how long have you been a, a practitioner now, a fully-fledged practitioner? Uh, about 11 years. Obviously, you years. don't look old enough for that. Should oh, that. Mm, yeah. Very good one. Wow, <laughs> you're <laughs> making up for other... <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, uh, moving on rapidly, the, um, you do everything, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, so you do yeah. cardiac, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep, two So hearts. no boundaries to practice. No, nope. there are, um, the, the, the uh, limitations on our scope of practice are pretty much... I mean, we can do everything. Um, right now... Nurse anesthetists are training to do echocardio- echocardiography, but in TEEs yeah. and the OR, but we d- most of the time don't but do that. Shock horror probe, you can intubate somebody, put a central line, put an arterial line, float a swan gans catheter without having been to medical school. I'm not sure, quite sure right. how that works out. <laughs> I guess, in a way, that is partly the threat, and I'm putting that in inverted commas, isn't it? Well, that's the question. Why would you want to go through a medical school then? You might, yeah. one might say, if you can do that without but, but the thing is i mean to the, to the point i mean in in the u.s there are a lot of nurse anesthetists that can practice completely independently and they do practice in solo practice mm. a lot of that happens in rural areas it can happen in more urban areas the practice where i've been the last 12 years was very collaborative we worked in an anesthesia care team model so it was nurses and physicians i think sometimes the the level of supervision could change a little bit but i mean it was a collaborative effort. And in the heart room, it wasn't just me all the time. I mean, I did a lot on my own. But if there were ever cases where we needed, you know, I needed more help, more expertise, someone that's been doing it for longer, do the tea. I mean, it was very collaborative. And we, it was, you know, always a great working relationship. And I think it can, it can work like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think and, everyone recognizes that there are physicianly components of, the provision, of, of being yeah. a provider in an anesthesia care mm. team. In the same way that there are sometimes nursing skills that are brought Absolutely. to bear that are, mm-hmm. that are different, overlapping circles. But it's a care team almost everywhere, isn't it? Yeah. That's the, the, that's the predominant model. I, and mm. are these things are interlinked, Monty. If, if the vision is perioperative medicine, I don't I, think we're going to deliver perioperative medicine if the consultant anesthetic body are standing in an anesthetic room welded to an anesthetic machine. I think we have to be overarching and we have to be working where the, where the work is. Yeah, mm. I, I agree. I mean, I think that there's a, in perioperative medicine or perioperative care i think there's a huge opportunity for the collaborative teamwork and i think that whether it's in the or whether it's in critical care or wherever it is you know there is a a need for advanced practice providers and 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 providers that are trained at whatever level they are and it can work really well and actually benefit the patient (laughs) and benefit Um, everyone and slightly off piece monty and i have have a colleague um who was a itu nurse a research nurse and is now a manager. So I would also quite like sort of um, AAs to sort of move through that potentially into sort of move, move up the ceiling if they want to yeah. break, the, break the ceiling to, to other ways of influencing practice. Um, so last couple of minutes, guys. Um, what's over the horizon? What's coming next? Rob, education? What's, yeah, what, what's, uh, what are you going to do? Our uh, full integrated BSC. Um, I think we're going to just have more, sort of, from, from a UCL side, going to have more people just moving into uh, UCL teaching a load of other things. So, sort of communication, patient safety, uh, and things like that. So, so, an integrated BSC, to remind people, is medical students take a, a year out that's and right. do knock off another BSC. degree oh, that's in, right. in a year. That's right. and so, they do the first two years pre clinical. And the new one is going to be? In uh, probably acute and extreme uh, physiology. Okay, so building on, because before there's been the, uh, the CASE, the Correct. Center for Altitude Space Extreme Environment Medicine Intercalated yeah. BSC, yeah. which has been extremely popular at UCL yeah. as well, with the Everest gang, etc. Yeah. yeah, so that's you're building right. on that. So yeah. that's one of your next few projects. If I'm going to get into teaching at UCL, the medical yeah. students, yeah. do I come and see you, Rob? Yeah, Google UCL Stevens. Good, yeah, say it again. UCL, UCL Stevens. And okay. actually, we, you did a great podcast with Aww. Joff last year at the Thank ASA. You. Oh, I've loved it. I've listened to it multiple times. So be sure to check that out. You can Switch. search uh, Rob Stevens in the, the search function oh. and, and listen. Yeah, and come really and good. join us at UCL. All you have to do is fill the paperwork in online, send your application in. Can I get a job there, Rob. guys? Yeah, sure. <laughs> There's always a job for you. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> David, over your horizon? Oh, yeah. uh, it's getting into the CPD space in okay. a stronger way. Mm. Um, and that's in for our non-European uh, 
listener CPDs. Yeah, so professional education, yeah, professional CME. practice, CME, yeah. indeed. Um, there's a great market, if we think about it like that, but actually there's a great need to educate people in perioperative medicine. And it isn't all about credit-bearing MSCs or free courses. There is a panoply of things that we're mm. not developing and should be developing, and I think next year will be all about reaching out to that group. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to catch us on all of our social media platforms, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. We're going to be doing a lot of tweeting today, so, so check us out. Tag us if you want. And um, thank you for listening. Brilliant. Cool. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thanks for joining. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Top it talk. Nick Majerison here. Have you got yourself onto edpom.org yet? If not, you might not be aware, Edpom Chicago. Tickets are free for a limited period only. Go now to edpom.org, evidence-based perioperative medicine. edpom.org.